something bad happened to the turtle. And Brian McLaren tells this story in his book, A Generous Orthodoxy. It's a story about not just any kind of turtle, but the worst kind of turtles. One of the ugliest and most dangerous, a snapping turtle. He captures their menacing appearance quite well, if you'd let me read to you. Snapping turtles are normally quite ugly, gray, often sporting a slimy coating of algae, trailing a long, serrated, gator-like tail, and fronted by massive and sharp jaws that can damage, if not sever, a careless finger or two. This turtle was even uglier than most. It was grossly deformed due to a plastic bottle cap ring about an inch and a half in diameter that it had accidentally acquired when it was a hatchling, when it too was an inch and a half hmm. in diameter. The ring fit around its midsection like a black belt then. But now, nearly a foot long and weighing nine pounds, the animal was corseted by the ring so that it looked like a figure eight. Now, I no sooner got done typing that quote into the manuscript of my sermon, and I went home for lunch. And while I was walking along Norwich Street, I uh, found just such a ring. Probably from the top of a bottle cap. So I've made Norwich Street safe for snapping turtles. <laughs> Now, if you had grown up with my grandfather, you probably wouldn't have a lot of sympathy for snapping turtles. He used to rent this old man cave of a camp down on the shores of Stiles Pond in Boxford, Massachusetts. My aunt thought it was absolutely disgusting, which is why I never spent much time there with my cousins. But I spent a lot of time there with my grandfather, and on the shores of Stiles Pond was also the YMCA camp that uh, I was a camper at. Now all the other campers came to the uh, camp based the uh, yellow school bus up from Danvers, Massachusetts, but I paddled over in my little red canoe. And one day while we were in camp, uh, a great deal of hysteria broke out. It seems they found this really, really big snapping turtle right in the middle of camp. And one of the counselors looked at me and said, uh, go get your grandpa. He'll know just what to do. Had I known what my grandpa was going to do, I probably wouldn't have gone to get him. But I paddled back to the camp and said, Grandpa, Grandpa, there's a big turtle in the camp. They need your help. I'll be right over, he said, popping on his palm walls and got into his wooden rowboat with a three-horse Evergreen motor and his 22 caliber rifle. And all the campers except me were sent away. Maybe because it was my grandfather doing the dirty deed, I was given a special initiation into the ways of real men. Well, I probably don't have to tell you any more about the story to let you, you probably already figured out how it ends. But something really bad happened to that turtle. In the first sermon of this series, we talked about how Jesus dying on the cross is the way by which our sins are forgiven. Roseanne lifted up about how through the cross we are set free from our fear of death. Last Sunday, I preached about how in Jesus is dying, the divine nature is revealed. This morning I want to lift up that by the things Jesus taught, 
We are given the tools that we need to build a good society and the type of world that God intends. So let's be attentive to what he taught, if not for our own sakes, at least for the sake of the church. Now, I've kind of long fancied myself to be something of a liberal Protestant. I get unduly excited about the names Paul Tillich, Rudolf Boltmann, and Marcus Bohr, and I can just see how thrilled you are to it. And as such, I kind of had a front row seat to a fairly ugly debate that's gone on in the life of the church over the last 30 years. And probably since confession is good for the soul, I've probably been a little more than a spectator in that debate. We witnessed to a time of bifurcation when the church is kind of divided around the matter of uh, saving souls for heaven. And that's been pitted against saving human lives in the here and the now. We in our different theological camps have been awfully good at making caricatures of another. And I've never been described by a more conservative evangelical with greater accuracy, charity, and grace than by Brian McLaren, the person who begins, who told the turtle story. And this is what he writes. And I appreciate what he has to say. Jesus' teachings and acts of love, healing, justice, and compassion offer a way of life that, in practice, bring blessing to the whole world. Our mission, then, is to bring the teachings and the example of Jesus to bear on our world, not only on our personal relationships, but also on the political structures and the cultural systems of our time. So when Jesus multiplies a boy's loaves and fish to feed a multitude, we are being told in the language of poetry that if we give whatever little we have, God will make it far more effective than we could imagine. But when Jesus heals a paralytic, we can see our own spiritual paralysis more clearly, and we can believe that that paralysis can be healed. Or when Jesus heals blindness, we acknowledge our own blindness, and need for enlightenment and new vision. These stories actually inspire us to feed the hungry by sharing our bread, to build and to staff hospitals, to cure, to cure the blindness of ignorance through education and art, to cross racial, racial and cultural boundaries, in love, to face corrupt systems, even at risk of our own lives. Even for many liberal Protestants who question the literal validity of many of the stories of Jesus, the meaning, the message is true and God-given and can have an impact on us and through us on our world. I wonder if the long winter of theological division is yielding to a new spring.
So there in the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus begins to teach about what it takes to build a good society. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because I've been anointed to preach good news to the poor, the release to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind. You see, whatever hope had stirred in the ancient prophet Isaiah was finding a fulfillment in this Jesus of Nazareth. He perceived something about God and something about the way we were living together that could be better. That poverty is neither a sign of abandonment nor a sign of failure. The core of his message is that there is hope. There is hope. The core of his message is that whoever is captive, and it doesn't matter what your captivity is, it is the will of God that you be free. The message of Jesus is that there will be an end to blindness. Surely he means the physical blindness, and surely he means so much more. So just as Jesus got going that day in Nazareth, when he began to lift up what the good society is, the way that human beings ought to relate with one another, he ran into a little resistance. The hometown crowd was shocked that they were so shocked that they ran him out of town. They wanted to kill him. But Jesus kept on teaching. And I hope that you and I will keep on persisting in our faith even when we experience resistance. By the teachings of Jesus, we know that all of us are like that turtle bound with that plastic ring corseting its shell. That each one of us in one way or another has been marred. And that that's not God's will for our lives. By the teachings of Jesus, we know that it's not just an individual thing, that it happens to the whole world. That our days are corseted by greed and selfishness and structures of society must yield righteousness instead. By the teachings of Jesus, we know that we shouldn't litter ponds with plastic wings, rings. And by the teachings of Jesus, we know that Dr. Seuss said so much more than a cute little children's poem. Human dignity and human rights are inherent in creation, and human dignity and human rights ought to be our agenda as the people of faith. By the very teachings of Jesus, we know that prejudice is wrong. And by the teachings of Jesus, we know our grandfathers were wrong. Real men don't kill things. I could never figure out why my grandfather didn't just take that turtle, put it in his boat, go out to the middle of the pond and let it go. You know, a snapping turtle can live for 150 years. Probably been there for a century and not hurt anybody. But I got quite an argument from my grandfather when I suggested that. So Brian McLaren goes on to talk about the folks who found that snapping turtle. Uh, you know what they did? 
They uh, risked their fingers. They reached out to that turtle that was corseted by this ring, and they broke the ring. I had to practice this, but I only have one ring. <laughs> they broke that ring. You know what happened to the turtle? Absolutely nothing. It looked just like it looked. But something was different for that turtle that day. From that day on, it had a future. That turtle would have eventually died had that ring not been broken. But over the next century or so, that shell had opportunity to become what God intended. That turtle had a chance to live. Even now, that ring that's coarsening you is being broken. And even now, you are blessed with an opportunity to help break the ring that courses another. We might not feel any different today than we did yesterday. And the ebb and the flow of politics might not change in the moment. But by the teachings of Jesus, we know that rings must be broken. By the teachings of Jesus, God is saving the turtles. By the teachings of Jesus, God is saving us all. And by the teachings of Jesus, we're challenged to do what we can to build a good and just society.